Okay, aloha. Congratulations, you made it past the midterm. We talked about everything from reproductive anatomy to uh, <clears throat> gamete reproductive cell transport, conception and development all the way through birth and the neonatal period. Um, that was the easy part of the semester. Now we're gonna get into the really nitty gritty heavy duty stuff. <clears throat> we're gonna start talking about development in a system by system fashion, all right? So we're gonna start with the nervous system. The nervous system is one of the very first systems to begin developing and it is the last system to finish development. Also as a chiropractor, it is one of the systems I deal with the very most. So it's near and dear to my heart, which is why this is where we're gonna start. I wanna make sure that we don't miss it. <clears throat> okay, so let's dive in here. You may recall that the nervous system, the development of the nervous system starts in the third week of gestation uh, with the formation of the notochord. The formation of the notochord induces neuralation, right? Uh, so the appearance of the, the appearance of the neural plate, which is induced by the notochord, is when development of the nervous system starts at about the third week of gestation. Uh, I repeated that twice because it's probably going to show up on a quiz at some point. Uh, so down here you have, you know, this is the primitive streak. We've got the primitive node, which of course here they call the primitive knot. I don't know why they keep changing the names of stuff. Anyway, primitive node, primitive pit, notochord grows out of the primitive pit. And as soon as the notochord um, grows through the deeper layers of tissue, boom, neurulation begins. We have a neural plate forming. Uh, as the neural plate forms, it begins to thicken near the center. It forms two ridges called the neural folds with a groove in between called the neural groove. This should all be review, right? Uh, so as the neural groove and the neural folds form, the top of the neural folds uh, differentiate into neural crest tissue. Uh, and this area down here differentiates into what is called surface ectoderm. And then, of course, the neural folds continue to proliferate and enlarge and get bigger and they wrap around and zip together at the top until we have this nice cute neural tube with a neural crest up above it and then the surface ectoderm um, above those ones. <clears throat> right? Now, um, as the neural tube fuses, it fuses from the center outward in both directions. So it starts in the center and it fuses towards the caudal end and towards the cranial end. Now it, it's worth taking a moment to note at this point, again, I think we mentioned it before, but just to make sure you're aware, as we start going into the brain, <clears throat> um, cranial is gonna become rostral. So the brain is in the cranium. So it doesn't make any sense to say the cranial end of the cranium. Right, so what they'll do is in the, within the brain, they'll talk about the rostral end and the caudal end. Rostral just means towards the front of the brain and caudal means towards the tail, towards the back of the brain, right? So anyway, we get a fusion of the neural tube starting at the center and going rostral and caudal. As that happens, you end up with these two openings on the front and the back called the neuropores. We have a rostral neuropore and a caudal neuropore. Uh, at this point in time, oops, sorry about that. At this point in time, the neural tube is still in open communication with the amnion. Amniotic fluid can flow in, it can flow out. Uh, and that's very important for the nutrition of the nervous system. Uh, let's see. The cranial pore closes at about day 25 and the caudal closes about two days after that. This coincides with establishment of blood circulation to the neural tube, which makes perfect sense because before circulation is established, nutrition is all by diffusion. So the more, so there needs to be communication with the amnion so that fresh fluid carrying fresh nutrients can get inside this thing and provide nourishment for the inner cells of the neural tube as well as the outer cells of the neural tube. 
uh, the more surface area, the better when you're dealing with diffusion, right? Uh, so once circulation is established, uh, the neural pores close and the nervous system, central nervous system becomes closed off from the rest of the body, never to be opened again. Uh, let's see, uh, this closed off neural canal is gonna become the ventricular system of the brain and in the spinal cord, it's gonna become the central spinal canal. So, oh, <laughs> looks like I skipped a slide. Anyway, in order to get, so this slide just shows as it zips closed from the middle to the outside, you've got the rostral neuropore, the caudal neuropore, this one closes first, then this one closes. Anyway, as we get later in the process, it's all closed, closed off. Now, in order for you to fully appreciate the development of the brain, we need to really understand what the end product looks like. So we're gonna do just a real basic um, review of brain anatomy. For some of you, I know that this is a review and that's great. Uh, please be patient through this part of the lecture for the sake of those who have not had brain anatomy yet. <laughs> um, and this is not gonna be very, a very deep look. This is just gonna be very basic and cursory. Uh, we're not going into any great depth. So first of all, you need to know the difference between gray matter and white matter, okay? Gray matter is all this stuff around the edges. Gray matter is made up primarily of uh, nerve cell bodies. Neural cell bodies is what makes up the gray matter. Now the white matter, which is this inner part here, white matter is made up of nerve axons primarily. Now, of course, there's axons running through because the axons have to run from here to there. So there's some axons running through the gray matter, but gray matter is primarily cell bodies. And white matter is primarily made up of uh, axons, right? These run in uh, groups of nerve axons called tracts. And then here in the center of the brain, we have this other gray matter looking stuff. It is in fact, a type of gray matter. These are nuclei. Brain nuclei are made up of cell bodies. The function of the nuclei is uh, mostly to produce chemicals such as neurotransmitters and things like that, that the brain utilizes in order to function. Uh, let's see. So next we're gonna go over the lobes of the brain, right? We have the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, and this down here is the cerebellum. Uh, the frontal lobe is primarily responsible for higher thought and motor function. The parietal lobe's primary um, function is sensory. Now this guy integrates a lot with the frontal lobe in order to initiate movements in response to various stimuli. Uh, down here we have the, uh, um, sorry, uh, the temporal lobe. This temporal lobe is responsible for language, math, art, auditory interpretation, and stuff like that. Back here we have the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is the primary visual cortex. It's responsible for interpreting visual stimuli. And then the cerebellum is responsible for balance and coordination of automatic skeletal movements like walking and running, uh, you know, things that you do without thinking too much about it. Uh, now, there is one additional lobe that you can't see from the outside and that's here, this is number one. This is the uh, limbic lobe. So the limbic lobe is primarily deals with emotion and smell. Interestingly enough, emotion and smell are very closely tied together, uh, which is one of the reasons why smells can evoke such a strong emotional response when you smell that perfume that just reminds you of that special someone, or when you smell that food that reminds you of that time you got really, really sick, or you know whatever it is. Smells can often invoke a really strong emotional response, and that's because that are, those areas of your brain are really closely tied together. Uh, so number two right here is the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum, its primary job is to connect the two halves of the brain, uh, connects them together so that they can communicate with each other as necessary, because obviously your right and your left sides are doing things that are coordinated, so there needs to be communication between the two. Number three is the pineal gland. That pineal gland is um, 
responsible for coordinating your circadian rhythm, your sleep wake cycle is mostly what it, uh, it, it secretes hormones that regulate your sleep wake cycle. Uh, number four down here, this is the mammillary body. The mammillary body uh, plays a big role in memory recall. So when you can't think of it, it's on the tip of your tongue and you just can't bring it to your brain, um, that's your mammillary body failing you. It happens to me a lot. It seems to happen more the older I get to. Uh, anyway, uh, moving on. Number five, this is the midbrain. Uh, midbrain is involved with motor, uh, motor coordination, eye motor control, visual and auditory processing, your sleep-wake cycle, alertness, temperature regulation, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Number six right here is the pons. Uh, the pons communicates between the forebrain and the cerebellum. Uh, and it also contains nuclei involved in sleep, respiration, swallowing, bladder control, hearing, equilibrium, taste, eye movement, sensation, motor control of the face, and posture. Whole bunch of stuff. Number seven is the medulla oblongata. For those of you that saw Happy Gilmore, it controls the aggression in a crocodile. <laughs> now, for purposes of our class, um, the medulla oblongata is uh, responsible for breathing, cardiovascular function, digestion, swallowing, sneezing, and coughing. But you'll notice that there's some degree of overlap between all these different parts of the brain, and that's because uh, they help each other. They, they integrate between each other to control all these different functions, all right? Number eight is the optic chiasm and the opt optic nerve. This guy transmits information from the eye to the brain for processing. That's pretty much his only job. Uh, number nine is the pituitary gland. And this guy sec secretes a whole plethora of different hormones, many, many of them. All right, now this is the choroid plexus, the choroid plexus. Um, this is an up close view of the choroid plexus that I borrowed from the internet, so you can't uh, share this with other people. Uh, I just think it's a really cool picture. Uh, so the primary function of the choroid plexus is to create cerebral spinal fluid, CSF. We're gonna talk a little bit more about him later. Uh, so the entire brain and the spinal cord are all surrounded by these uh, bags of tissue called meninges, right? And um, meninges, so you've got the skull here. This is in the brain. So you've got the skull out here, the hard bone. And then just on the inside of the skull, you have this thick fibrous layer of the meninges called the, oops, called the dura mater. The dura mater, I always remember that because it's the durable one, right? The dura mater is the thick fibrous coating around all the nervous system. This guy actually is continuous with all your nerve sheaths. It wraps around your whole brain and your spinal cord, and it has a lot of implications for spinal and cranial dysfunction in the world of chiropractors. <clears throat> I end up working with this guy a lot uh, through various means. Now, uh, this next one here is called the arachnoid matter. The arachnoid matter is, I guess, the in-between layer, and then you have the pia mater, which lines the surface of the brain. Now, you'll notice that the pia mater and the arachnoid mater are connected by this like web of connective tissue, right? In the sub, so this is called the subarachnoid space. And the subarachnoid space is also filled with cerebral spinal fluid. The purpose of this is to create padding, to create a fluid filled cushion for the brain. Now these um, connective tissues go all the way around, they circle around the entire brain so that the entire brain is suspended by these. So when the brain tries to move that way, it pulls on uh, the ones over here. When the brain tries to move this way, it pulls on the ones over here. So they keep the brain kind of stationary. They get, so it's kind of like having a ball suspended by a whole bunch of bungee cords in one place so that it can move in every direction, but it limits the amount of movement in, in every direction and cushions it. Same kind of idea. So there's this fluid filled space and all these tethers that try to keep the brain from smacking up against the side of the skull. And it does take quite a lot of force to get this brain to smack up against the side of the skull. You don't want that because that causes a concussion, a traumatic brain injury, and those are not good to have. 
right? So we, we like the subarachnoid space and we like the pia and the, and the arachnoid mater and, and, and how they function together. Uh, anyway, I digress. The point of this is to protect the brain from damage. Now, right here, uh, development of the brain has already begun, right? As the neural plate forms during week three in response to the formation of the notochord. Very good. Um, so anyway, as the neural plate forms, neuroectoderm cells are already migrating and beginning to differentiate into the different cell types uh, that appear in the different parts of the brain. It's worth mentioning here that when we're talking, oh, I already talked about rostral versus caudal, um, so we can skip that part. Um, so yeah, up here, this would be the rostral part of the brain. This would be the caudal part of the brain. Anyway, you, you get the point. Uh, now, um, as the neural tube forms, even before it has fully fused, you start to see three primary vesicles form. So a vesicle equals an outpouching, right? So there are three primary vesicles that form even before the neural tube is fully formed. We have up here, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain, okay? So this is the wall of the brain, and this is the fluid-filled cavity in the middle of the brain, right? And of course, you have these other names for it, the proencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the rhomencephalon. Uh, I don't think that I need you to remember those. Uh, but anyway, um, the forebrain here is ultimately destined to become um, the cerebral hemispheres, right? It's going to become... Um, all of the associated structures with the cerebral hemispheres. The mid and hind brain together are going to become uh, the brain stem. And then uh, once you get to about week five during the fifth week, these guys are going to further differentiate and they're going to separate into more vesicles. So now we have five secondary vesicles. All right. Um, so we have the primary vesicles. Uh, primary vesicle that's going to become the cerebral hemispheres and the lateral ventricles. The space inside of it is going to become the lateral ventricle. We have the diencephalon that's going to become the thalami and all the stuff associated with that. Um, the mesencephalon or the midbrain, which, which is going to become the midbrain. You have the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. So the metencephalon is going to become the pons and the cerebellum. And then the myelencephalon is going to become the medulla. Now, these five secondary vesicles are going to be on the quiz. So make sure that you know them, okay? Uh, let's see, moving on. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention it at the beginning of the lecture, but we are gonna split the brain, the formation of the brain into two lectures. We're gonna spend the entire week tackling just the formation of the brain. And I know in the book, they talk about, uh, you know, the spinal cord first and then the brain and then the peripheral nervous system, but that makes absolutely no sense to me that they would have it in that order. So in my world, we're gonna talk about the brain first and we're gonna work our way from the top down and out. So we're gonna talk about the brain first and then the spinal cord and then the peripheral nervous system. Um, I'll try to keep you, you know, uh, informed of like the page numbers. So the section on the brain kind of starts on page 262 in the book and it goes through, uh, what, like, um, let me see here. It goes all the way through 271. That's the section on the brain. Um, and then the Spinal cord is the beginning of chapter 16 and the peripheral nervous system is the end of chapter 16. So I know we're going out of order, but bear with me. It makes more sense to me if we approach it this way. Uh, this week will be all about the brain. Next week will be all about um, the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system. Uh, and both of those quizzes are tougher <laughs> than what you've experienced so far. They're a little bit longer and a little more difficult, but don't worry. You guys are gonna study, we're gonna do a good review and you guys are gonna crush it just the way that I am sure you crushed the midterm. Uh, anyway, where was I? Uh, okay, so we have uh, this guy. 
<laughs> uh, this guy, the, uh, so the brain is growing really, really fast, okay? Which is one of the factors in the folding of the embryo. The brain grows super fast and that causes the embryo to kind of fold over, sends that cardiac area down to the chest as, uh, as you know, the tissue grows at different rates. Um, but the embryo is not the only thing that, that is folding. The brain also grows, uh, different parts of the brain grow at different rates uh, during the fourth and fifth week. And this causes folding in the brain to occur as well. So the first thing that you see is the midbrain flexure and the cervical flexure. And right after that, you see this pontine flexure, which uh, happens in the opposite direction of the other two. So this one's you know, flexed this way and the cervical flexure is flexed the same direction, and the, but the pontine flexure is flexed to the opposite way. All right, you are gonna need to know these primary um, flexures. They're gonna be on the quiz. <clears throat> You're gonna wanna know the first three flexures that occur in the brain. Uh, at any rate, um, as the pontine flexure develops up here, this creates a thin spot in the roof of, of the brain. Uh, the, the, um, the roof of the adjacent brain gets very thin and you end up with something like this, right? So you have over the top of the fourth ventricle, this roof plate that's very thin. And then you have the uh, floor of the brain, which is considerably thicker, okay? Um, so this is a slice through the fourth ventricle. Uh, this is a little bit higher up than, you know, the, this line's clear down here, but this slice is more like up here, okay? Uh, for those of you that are paying attention to stuff like that. Um, so this is a slice through the fourth ventricle and you'll notice that we have these alar plates and these basal plates. Uh, the alar plates, which are only present in the uh, midbrain and the hindbrain, are destined to become sensory and motor tracts that are running to and from the spinal cord. So you're gonna wanna know that these, these are both efferent and afferent. So afferent means that they're running uh, into the brain and efferent means they're running away from the brain, right? E for exit, E for efferent. That's a good trick, for, at least for me to remember it. E exit, E efferent. So the efferent um, tracks are exiting the brain and the afferent tracks are coming back into the brain. And these alar plates uh, turn into both of those. Um, so these arrows represent alar plate cells that are going to break off and migrate to a different part of the brain. Uh, and they're going to become a nucleus called the olivary nucleus that we can see right here. So this olivary nucleus uh, Let's see. So uh, also notice that the alar and basal plates further differentiate into tracks. Uh, and you'll see on the diagram that there are more afferent tracks than there are efferent tracks. There are more signals coming back to the brain than there are going out from the brain, right? So that's gonna be something that you also might see on the quiz that there are more afferent than efferent tracks, right? So, <clears throat> Uh, the pontine flexure divides the brain, um, divides, sorry, divides the hindbrain into the metencephalon and the mesencephalon. So the metencephalon is rostral and the metencephalon is um, caudal. Now the metencephalon is destined to become the pons and the cerebellum. This guy up here is going to become the pons and the cerebellum. And the, um, let me make sure I got that right. Yeah. And the myelencephalon is going to become the medulla oblongata, right? Now then, uh, so once you get down to the developing medulla, so this is going to be a slice through here, through the hindbrain, right? Uh, so once you get down to the developing medulla, uh, it looks more like this. Uh, now the nuclei here are formed from cells that migrate from the alar and basal plates. Right, you have these cuneate nu the cuneate nucleus and the uh, gracile nucleus, and these guys are forming from cells that are migrating from the alar and basal plates. Right, you have the central layer of gray matter, and uh, uh, these two dark uh, dark blue places down here, these are the pyramids. And what the pyramids are, are they are basically white fiber. They are cortical spinal tracts, a whole bunch of uh, clustered together uh, axons that run as the name implies for cortical spinal, they run straight from the brain to the spinal cord 
uh, in an un uninterrupted line. Um, so it's important to remember for the quiz that these nuclei in the hindbrain are formed from ailer and basal plate cells that migrate. You might want to write that down and remember it. All right, now a little higher up in the brain, we have these two bulges, right? This bulge up here is destined to become the cerebellum. This bulge down here is destined to become the pons. So a cross section of this area looks like this. Now remember those ailer plate cells? Some of those cells are gonna migrate up into here and they're gonna start proliferating and they're gonna start differentiating. And this is gonna to start to, as they proliferate and differentiate, they're gonna start swelling inward into this cavity. And in fact, they're gonna proliferate so much and swell inward so much that they're gonna completely overgrow this entire cavity. They're gonna completely overgrow the fourth ventricle. Um, once that happens, it's gonna start bulging out the top. And as it bulge out, bulges out the top, it becomes this nice ball shaped area that we, call, that we know of as the cerebellum. Uh, so it's important to remember that the cerebellum forms from migrating alar, uh, alar plate cells that migrate, differentiate, and proliferate into this nice big ball shaped structure card called the cerebellum. So you might wanna remember that for the quiz, right? Cerebellum, alar plate cells migrate, differentiate, swell inward and then swell outward. Um, some of the alar plate cells differentiate into cortical cells. Those are the cells around on the outside, the gray matter of the cerebellum basically. Um, some of the other alar plate cells will also form uh, into uh, all of the different uh, nuclei. Uh, let's see, uh, at the same time, other alar plate cells are migrating ventrally to form all of the pontine nuclei, uh, the sensory nuclei of the tri trigeminal nerve, as well as the cochlear and vestibular nuclei. So a lot of stuff happening from those alar plate cells. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, uh, do you remember that really thin roof in the fourth ventricle that we talked about? So uh, these cells up on the top, these are pia matter and arachnoid matter cells, right? Uh, these are gonna start uh, proliferating. And as they start proliferating, because this is a very thin area and they have no place else to go because up here is like, you know, the skull. I mean, it isn't formed yet, but uh, it's, it's just a membrane at this point, but there's no place for them to go upwards because there's this big fibrous dura matter up here. They can't really punch through that. So where they go is they go down they invaginate into, the pia matter invaginates into the fourth ventricle and this forms, uh, these cells then differentiate into choroid plexus cells. And this is how the choroid plexus is uh, formed. So it might be important to remember on a quiz someday that the choroid plexus is formed in the fourth ventricle by proliferation of the pia matter that invaginates into the fourth ventricle and then differentiates into choroid plexus. Now, uh, if you remember, I told you already once before, but I'm gonna re reiterate it again because that might also be on a quiz. Uh, the whole job, the primary function of the choroid plexus is to produce cerebral spinal fluid. That is all it's for. It creates cerebral spinal fluid for the brain and the spinal cord uh, anyway, there are also three places in the roof of the fourth ventricle. Uh, up in here, there are three places where apertures form. So an aperture is a fancy word for a hole. So little tiny openings form to allow CSF to exit and fill up the sub subarachnoid space. So that might also be important to remember for a quiz in the near future. The apertures in the roof of the fourth ventricle are there to allow CSF to exit and fill the arachnoid matter, uh, which allows the central nervous system to float in a bath of cerebral spinal fluid for protection. Okay, now that brings us to the midbrain. This guy changes less than any of the others, right? The central canal constricts into the cerebral aqueduct. 
And the alar plate cells migrate and form several nuclei, such as the inferior and superior uh, colliculi, the substantia nigra, which is down here. These are the inferior and superior colliculi. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is going to, oops. Inferior and superior is a reference to caudal versus um, um, caudal and rostral. So the superior colliculi is a little bit rostral. So they're up here. So the superior colliculi uh, colliculus is rostral to the inferior colliculus, which is a little bit caudal to it. Uh, anyway, so um, we have the trochlear nucleus and uh, the mesencephalic nucleus. Um, these are uh, cranial nerve nuclei. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, alar plate cells migrate and form several nuclei, uh, including these substantia nigra nuclei. And these guys right here, uh, the crust cerebri, these uh, big dark blue sections right here, these are again, um, white matter. These are um, nerve tracks, axon tracks. Uh, that are part of the cerebral um, cortical cerebral tract as well. So these are going to form the cerebral peduncles. Okay. Uh, let's see. And then this, of course, is the interpeduncular fossa, which is going to form as these guys get bigger and bigger. Right. They start out small as more and more um, as more and more tracks are added, then they get big. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's going to be it for the first half of lecture 10. Um, the second half of lecture 10 is also pretty meaty. <laughs> we're going to tackle next time we're going to tackle the forebrain, which is the most complicated piece of tissue in the entire world that human beings know about. Um, but yeah, this is gonna do it for lecture 10, part one. Please, if you have any questions or need clarification on anything, like I always tell you, write it down and bring it with you to the uh, Zoom meeting on Thursday. We can get all the information that you need clarified and help you um, review for the quiz. Uh, I love intelligent questions. They make my day happier. <laughs> especially the ones that stump me. I love learning new stuff. Uh, at any rate, have a great day. We'll see you at the next lecture. Aloha.